Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to today's webinar. I would like to remind you that this conference is being recorded. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. For those connected by telephone requiring operator assistance during the call, please press star zero. Web participants requiring support should use the chat feature on your screen. I would now like to turn the meeting over to your moderator for today, Ms. Kay Phillips, Senior Director at the Canadian Foundation for Healthcare Improvement. Please go ahead, Ms. Phillips. Hello and welcome everyone to today's on-call webinar titled Transforming Care for the Elderly, Tools and Resources to Improve Prescribing from Canadian and International Perspectives. I'm Kay Phillips, the Senior Director here at CFHI, and I'm pleased to be your host today. I've had the pleasure over the last couple of years of overseeing our Pan-Canadian Appropriate Use of Antipsychotic Collaborative, as well as the New Brunswick Appropriate Use of Antipsychotic Collaborative, in collaboration with my colleague Jen Major, who's our lead on that initiative. We're pleased to have more than 200 registrants for this session, and I see we're close to 40 on the line now. Now, as I introduce our guest speakers, I'd ask that you please take a moment to introduce yourselves in the chat box as well as let us know how many people are attending from your location using the poll on the screen. So please enter that number, including yourself. Now joining us today are Dennis Cleaver, and Dennis is the Executive Director of the Seniors Health Strategic Clinical Network with Alberta Health Services. Now Dennis, if you could dial in on the phone line, our producers have put the numbers on the chat and we can make sure that you're loud and clear. We also have Dr. Wendy Levinson, who's the chair of Choosing Wisely Canada and a professor of medicine at the University of Toronto. Welcome, Wendy. And also joining us is Dr. Justin Turner. Justin is the assistant director of the Canadian Deprescribing Network, also known as CADEN, and a postdoctoral research fellow at the Centre de Recherche Institut Université de Gériatrie de Montréal. We also have our producers, Sheena Powell and Kelly Ripley, operating behind the scenes here in Ottawa. We welcome all of you today. We're pleased to provide simultaneous interpretation for all on-call webinars. So this may result in a few quick pauses in the dialog box. We invite you to participate in our chat box in either of the official languages. Now at the end of today's webinar, we hope that you have increased some knowledge about how Canadian organizations are, and groups are improving prescribing and care outcomes for seniors and how Canadian organizations are working together to share their networks and tools. Also to know where to access tools that can help frontline providers advance efforts to improve prescribing. Finally, we have more strategies and tools to engage providers in conversations about appropriateness of interventions like medications to make more informed care decisions. So let's begin by talking about why there is such a concerted effort going on in Canada and internationally around appropriate use of antipsychotics. Health evidence tells us that the use of these medications should not account for more than 5 to 15 percent of residents in long-term care, but that the national average is actually much higher than that. Although antipsychotic medications are sometimes used to manage behaviors of people who have dementia, Symptoms that include aggression, resistance to care, and other challenging behaviors. Evidence demonstrates that person-centered therapies and solutions usually work better to address these behaviors. We also know that the use of antipsychotic medications can be associated with side effects that can negatively affect quality of life, such as sleepiness, confusion, dizziness, increased susceptibility to falls, and cognitive impairments. So if a medication review by a care team reveals the medication is no longer of benefit to the person, deprescribing is recommended. Now between 2014 and 2015, CFHI led a pan-Canadian appropriate use of antipsychotic collaborative with over 50 long-term care homes from seven provinces and one territory. Participants received seed funding and training to implement programs to reduce and eliminate antipsychotic use, along with coaching and mentoring educational materials, tools, and forums for sharing with other sites. The goal was to lower the use of antipsychotics and improve the quality of care and quality of life for residents. The Antipsychotic Reduction Collaborative has its roots in CFHI's EXTRA, or Executive Training Program. 
two managers with the Winnipeg Regional Health Authority designed an intervention to help multidisciplinary teams of healthcare providers better use data to inform care planning. At one site, staff were trained to provide non-pharmacological approaches to managing behaviors associated with dementia. And as a result, 27% of the cohort in just six months were taking off antipsychotic medications without any increases in behavioral symptoms. This innovation improved quality of life for patients and translated to potential cost savings of 400,000 in six months across the region. The key components of the intervention that participants learn about through the collaborative and implement in their organizations is pictured on this slide. The intervention involves education and person-centered care approaches. Education is provided to all staff so they're better able to identify possible causes and solutions to behaviors, such as aggression. It also includes multidisciplinary staff and family communication. This engagement is so critical, both with staff, family, leadership, and other stakeholders outside in the community. Also includes regular medication reviews, a key part of the intervention, that this be done at least quarterly, but more often during reduction time. Fourthly, de-prescribing guidelines. These are critical and include principles for safe reduction. And finally, ongoing data collection and monitoring to measure success and make adjustments to residents' needs as needed. Now pictured on this slide are the goals and the results of the Pan-Canadian Collaborative. You'll see that through adopting and implementing the intervention just described above, in the nursing homes that 54% of the residents targeted for antipsychotic medication reduction had their medication reduced or discontinued. Falls, verbal abuse, and instances of resisting care also decreased, and the amount of aggressive behavior had no increases. Overall, over the 14 to 16 month period, CFHI and its homes were very proud and happy to see the results that happened across the country. CFHI is pleased to now be scaling this appropriate use of antipsychotic intervention in the province of New Brunswick. In partnership with the New Brunswick Association of Nursing Homes and the Department of Social Development, all of the 66 nursing homes in the province are taking part in the New Brunswick Appropriate Use of Antipsychotic Collaborative. And welcome Julie Weir, who's also on the line today. We've been supporting 15 nursing homes since February of 2016, and we're already hearing stories of greatly improved resident quality of life, where the residents pictured here have experienced more wakefulness, mobility, and engagement in social activities, with no increase in aggression or other behaviors, as well as reductions in appropriate medication use. We've just welcomed the remaining nursing homes in the province and look forward to supporting them in their quality improvement work. This CFHI program is just one example of the great work being done in Canada to improve appropriate use of antipsychotic and care outcomes for the elderly. Next up, I'd like to invite Dennis Cleaver to tell us other examples of the initiatives being led across Canada around appropriate antipsychotic use. Over to you, Dennis. Okay, can you hear me well? Just a sound check? Yes, we can. Thanks, Dennis. Great, and I'm just looking for the button for advancing the slides. Oh, I see it there. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I'm Dennis Cleaver. I'm the Executive Director of the Seniors Health Strategic Clinical Network, and uh, I'm involved in an initiative in Alberta on the appropriate use of antipsychotics in long-term care and in supportive living across the, the province. Uh, today, what I want to be able to do, though, is talk about a pan-Canadian group, the appropriate use of antipsychotics Canadian connections, and uh, a little bit about how that group is benefiting uh, Canada uh, with regard to the use of antipsychotics. So this group came together in, uh, in a very small way in 2014, really started from uh, our inquiry to a couple of uh, people who completed one of the CFHI extra program projects in Middle Church in Winnipeg. They had some uh, very good results in that one site and we needed in Alberta here just to learn what they were doing in the one site so that we could uh, take some of those learnings and work with 10 sites in Alberta and then that learning from the 10 sites would help us inform the uh, provincial spread. So we started uh, with a very small group of us and we realized after a bit of time that other jurisdictions 
we're also addressing the use of antipsychotics in long-term care. So we invited others to join an informal group just to learn what each other is doing and sharing information. So the, the essence of the AUA Canadian Connections Group is about sharing and learning together. There's uh, really not too much more material uh, than that. As the group grew, we thought it would be a good idea to just better articulate our objectives. And you can see here on the slide, we've articulated uh, four objectives. The key one is just create opportunities to learn from one another. And, um, and it's working quite well, as you'll see a little bit later in the uh, presentation. At this point in time, there's in the order of 30 people that are attending the quarterly meetings uh, from the various organizations that are listed on the slide there. And uh, we're interested in having people join the group, this informal group, who have either a provincial or a national role uh, with regard to the use of antipsychotics. And I can see that the group is going to expand its interest to include other medications as well or people who are have a leadership role in a, uh, a larger health region. We're trying to avoid having this be a, uh, a long list of individual uh, long-term care centers so that we can focus on system-wide supports and how we can approach the use of antipsychotics at a, a large regional or provincial level. When we first started, I mentioned that there was a small leadership group and uh, one of the, the folks, Joe Puchniak, who is part of the EXTRA program, he moved on and then it was essentially Alberta that was leading the Canadian Connections AUA group. Uh, primarily myself, the manager I work very closely with, I think Molly Cole is on the line. We're uh, knitting together the group as it grew over time. And then it became really clear in the last year that uh, this national group was uh, of interest to each of the jurisdictions. And it just made sense that uh, the CFHI and Kai High also uh, had a leadership role in this group. So now we have three co-leads for this uh, informal AUA connections group. What kind of work? or what kind of topics do we look at? Well, you can see on the listing here that it's quite varied, but it includes learning, for example, about the CLEAR initiative in uh, British Columbia. It includes learning about some of the antipsychotic initiatives in Ontario. It includes learning about uh, CADEN and uh, uh, other items that are just listed there including the, the Newfoundland approach. So we're all not uh, just keeping our resources and learnings to ourselves. We're very uh, willing and freely sharing resources uh, with each other. In that context of sharing resources with each other, the AUA toolkit we developed to support the work in Alberta benefited uh, from a variety of um, sort of clinical inputs. Uh, we had an expert advisory group within Alberta that provided a lot of very good uh, guidance on what materials would be should be included on this AUA toolkit. But it also benefited from our learnings from the other jurisdictions. So there's materials there that we picked up uh, from our conversations with other uh, jurisdictions, including this CFHI National AUA Collaborative that was uh, mentioned a little bit earlier. And Interestingly, this uh, toolkit in part led to a, um, I, um, I just invite you to have a look at the toolkit, but interestingly that toolkit uh, that we're using here in Alberta is on a public website, but it's getting quite a bit of interest uh, hits from across the province and internationally as well. And it was a helpful resource when Choosing Wisely also decided uh, that it would be a good idea to have a, um, a more focused uh, AUA toolkit uh, available through the uh, Choosing Wisely piece, which will lead nicely into the, the next uh, presentation. Did you want to stop and pause for questions or comments here? Sure, we can uh, certainly open up to some questions or comments. I'm just looking through the chat box. Um, 
I don't see any questions just yet, Dennis, but if anything comes up, we'll certainly um, flag. Okay, great. I think I stayed Thank within you. my 10 minutes. That's great, absolutely. Thank you very much, Dennis. At this point, what we'll do is I'll be passing it over to Wendy, who uh, is going to share with us a little bit more on Choosing Wisely Canada and what Dennis was referring to in, in some of his slides. So thank you very much, Dennis, for that overview of the AUA Connections. And over to you, Dr. Wendy Levinson. Hi. Um, good afternoon to everybody. Um, so I'm going to drop back a little bit because um, you've heard some focused discussion on the use of antipsychotics. But Choosing Wisely is a broader program um, focused on overuse of unnecessary tests and treatments. And so um, I'm just going to tell you a little bit of the status of Choosing Wisely, and then I'll come back to the medications in particular and antipsychotics. So um, Choosing Wisely, as many of you probably know, is a campaign to help clinicians and patients engage in conversations about unnecessary tests and treatments and help them make smart choices for, their, for high quality care. Um, we really believed uh, when the campaign started in the US in 2012 from the American Board of Internal Medicine Foundation, um, and I was involved in those discussions, that the real issue was to try to get this to begin a conversation because for many years we've talked about underuse, but we've really never engaged the profession physicians where we started in particular in talking about overuse and the things that are sort of baked into our system where we do more than is necessary, but even more important, um, things that can even cause harm to patients. So the goal of the campaign was to stimulate that conversation. And we launched in Canada uh, just under three years ago in April of 2014. So what's unique about Choosing Wisely is that it's really a clinician-led and bottom-up approach. So, um, and it focuses on common clinical conditions. So the whole um, approach of Choosing Wisely was to work with national societies, uh, medical societies to begin with, but nursing is engaged and pharmacy is engaged now in Canada, and ask them to create a list of five tests, treatments, or procedures in their discipline for which there was excellent scientific evidence of overuse or even harm to patients. So the whole approach was grounded in what did clinicians themselves think that we overuse? And that could include medications, but wasn't limited to medications. So the campaign approach then, I just talked about the engagement of clinicians. And the beauty of that was that this is clinicians themselves in a bottom-up way saying, here are things that we should question. Not that we shouldn't do them, but we should question. And the societies that created these lists, the national societies, of course, have great uh, abilities to speak to their members through newsletters, journals, and annual or regional meetings. And so it got a lot of dissemination through, um, through those societies. Second plank was patience. So since this is about a conversation, we felt that it was very important to uh, educate on both sides. Now, our approach has been to reach patients mainly through primary care doctors' offices. And many of these are about medications, like not using antibiotics when it's a viral infection and they're not necessary, or not using proton pump inhibitors. And so I'll show you a little bit more later. We've developed a variety of patient materials with the theme being more is not always better. Um, I won't go into it, but we've had a whole, a very exciting plank around medical education. We think that learning this message early about being more selective is very important. And students, uh, Canadian medical students, have really rallied around the campaign and created a, a medical student campaign. We've moved from creating the list of five things to working on implementation across Canada, and that's where the toolkits come in and be building regional capacity. And I think Francoise Co is on the call, and she leads that. And we've also worked on developing measurement capacity. And we worked here, in particular, with Kaihai so that we can develop some measures that can be used in multiple jurisdictions across Canada to uh, assess overuse of these things, including antipsychotics, and um, to measure change. 
So there are multiple approaches, multiple planks in our approach. So where are we? Uh, I said we started um, uh, just under three years ago. There are over 200. There are actually at last count right before this call, like 215 recommendations. There are over 60 societies engaged, many of whom have released their lists, but some big societies are just in final stages, like obstetrics and gynecology. We've worked across Canada, um, and our patient slogan has this little hot dog here, which is more is not always better. Many of you may have seen it with too much mustard. Um, and one of the other things that just we don't have time to talk about, but it's quite interesting that Choosing Wisely is in now more than 20 countries in the world, and the Canadian team leads an informal consortium of the, uh, organ of the countries that are putting a Choosing Wisely campaign in place. So um, actually, this slide is a, a little bit outdated now, uh, and I just checked before the call. So there are 218 recommendations now, and medications represent now 30% of all the recommendations. So that's a lot of recommendations um, that specifically focus to medications which potentially are more harmful than helpful to patients and could be stopped or deprescribed. As I mentioned, we've shifted from creating the lists to trying to get the list to be put into practice, just the way you heard about, about trying to get the antipsychotics to be decreased in long-term care facilities. And so now we're really working across the country with regions, and many of these are building, um, with help, help, help of Health Canada, capacity to um, implement some of these recommendations in their own region based on their stakeholders. And so you, uh, there is now this regional network. So we have, as part of the regional networks, felt just like you heard about earlier, that toolkits are helpful. So instead of uh, everybody reinventing the wheel and uh, you know, putting together their own resources, we've tried to take some of the very common recommendations in Choosing Wisely and get them disseminated. So you, know, you heard about the one called um, When Psychosis Isn't the Diagnosis, and I can tell you there are a couple members of the staff that are really terrific with cute names. So another one you see on this slide is Bye Bye PPI, also a drug frequently used in the elderly, which is started for reflux but then never stopped. So here's an example of a pharmacy-led intervention at the Toronto Western Hospital where they decreased the use of proton pump inhibitors by 26% and reassessed the need in patients in 93% of their patients. And so we have this toolkit, um, appropriate especially for the ambulatory care setting. Another toolkit that's related to the elderly is the use of uh, sedatives. So this one's called less sedatives for your older relatives. And uh, this has been a very important piece of work because it is one of the indicators that we're doing with the Organization for Economic Development um, across the world, the OECD, where 40 countries now starting to have benchmarks about what proportion of their elderly patients are on sedative hypnotics that do more harm than good. And we have quite a number of groups with really robust data about decreasing the use of sedative hypnotics, particularly in, um, in, the, in the hospital. But of course, keratinum bomb has done just excellent work decreasing them in the outpatient setting. And I think you'll hear about that more in the next talk. So we've now got uh, a variety of these toolkits up on our website uh, for any of you that are interested in those uh, medications beyond the antipsychotics. So I'm going to stop there and pass, uh, pass it on to Justin um, so you can hear about the deep prescribing network. Excellent. Thank you for that, Wendy. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm really here to talk about who is Caden. So Caden is the deep Canadian deep prescribing network. As you may guess from my accent, and I apologize if I'm hard to understand, I'm not Canadian, I'm Australian. But I'm here working with the Canadian Deep Prescribing Network, which is a group of patient advocates, healthcare professionals, researchers, and even politicians that came together just over two years ago because they all shared a passion to improve the way we use medication use in older Canadians. So the graphic we've got on the right there shows 
Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So the graphic we've got on the right comes from our recent publication in the Canadian Journal of Aging, and it really shows how Caden is focused in the inner circle on individual patients, their caregivers, and the public. And we know that they are housed and surrounded by healthcare providers who work within health regulation organisations, and that's controlled by governments as far as policy and regulation goes. So Caden has developed a range of arms to try and focus on these in particular. So we have an arm that's working on research to both improve research and deprescribing, prescribing promote research, and also research some of the tools that we have to make sure that they're effective at reducing inappropriate medicines. We've got tools focusing on patients and healthcare providers too. So the goal and the aim of Caden is to reduce inappropriate medication use by 50% by the year 2020. We're also hoping to promote and ensure safe access to drug and non-drug pharmacological and non-drug therapies that can be used to manage things such as inappropriate behaviours or sleeping, which are common classes of drugs that are used inappropriately. So today I want to showcase just a few of our patient and caregiver and healthcare provider tools that we have developed to help us try and achieve these goals. All of these tools are freely available on the website in both English and French. Or if you'd like hard copies, contact me after this and I'm more than happy to send them out to you. So the first brochure I'd like to talk about is the one that Wendy just mentioned, which is the Empower brochure. Empower brochures came from a trial called Eliminating Medication through Patient Ownership of End Results. And it's really designed to empower or motivate patients, their families and caregivers, by giving them extra knowledge and changing beliefs. The brochure I'm going to flick through today is on antipsychotics, but the trial that, that Wendy referred to was based on, on benzodiazepines. We found that just by posting the brochure to people who chronically use benzodiazepines, we were able to achieve a 27% complete reduction at six months, compared to 5% in the, in the control arm. This relates to just four brochures needed to be post, posted out to patients for one of them to stop, which is really, really impressive results when it comes to stopping benzodiazepines. The brochures start with a brief quiz, talking about the benefits and harms of medications, and it's really to challenge patients on how much do they really know about their medications. The brochures go on then to provide the answers, and often patients get them wrong. This is a good thing because it can lead to cognitive dissonance, where patients are uncertain because all of a sudden we've challenged what they believed and what they thought was true. This can make patients reevaluate why are they really taking these medicines. And that's a perfect point to bring in, are there any alternatives? Now as we're talking about the antipsychotics, there, there are two uses that they're commonly used for. One of them is as a sedative and the other to try and treat or manage disruptive behaviours in people with dementia. So the brochure covers both aspects of those and brings in some lifestyle interventions and non-drug related interventions. Also, for example, for sedatives, we have a sedative brochure, uh, a how to improve your sleeping brochure without sedatives that talks on some simple cognitive behavioural therapy ideas. And we link through to Sleepwell Nova Scotia, a group in Nova Scotia who's doing some fantastic CBT online. After we've talked them about some alternatives, we go on to mention peer champions. We've got two stories of people who are just like them, or just like their spouses, who are on these medications and might have some trouble getting off them. We talk about the story of the person, what they went through, and how they were able to discontinue their medication. Again, because antipsychotics may have a couple of inappropriate uses, we cover both of these in the brochure. Now our research has shown that to improve deprescribing, it's really beneficial to have a really set, simple, easy to follow tapering protocol. We found that both patients and healthcare providers love being able to show this is how we're going to cut down the medications. So the brochures all finish with a tapering protocol. And then on the last page, a section for patients to ask questions because we found most patients after reading it have questions they want to ask their doctor 
by the time they reach their doctor, they may have forgotten. So these brochures have been designed to be used by both patients if they're cognitively able, or for the caregivers or family for patients. There are many other tools available for improving medication appropriateness. One of my favourites is MedStopper, which has been developed over in BC. It was a tool designed for healthcare providers to really answer the question, what is the evidence for benefit or harm of certain medications in frail elderly people? Now, so far they've got over four to 500 different medications with over 150 different diseases as part of their algorithm. It's been really well received by healthcare providers and we're now working with them to try and make a patient version so that it's simple for patients to log on, put in a list of their medications and see, should I be taking this? Is it beneficial? Can I stop and how do I go about that? On our website at deprescribing.org, we also have a range of resources for patients to help improve their sleep. And Barb Farrell's group in Ottawa has done a lot of fantastic work in the last few years looking at deprescribing guidelines and algorithms for how do we deprescribe drugs. Now this was really driven by healthcare providers and doctors in particular saying, I want to stop medications but I don't know how. Is there any evidence? What do I do and do I need to follow up? So using an evidence-based process, their teams reviewed the literature, brought together interprofessional guideline teams, and then piloted and tested these guidelines and their algorithms, both in an aged care setting and in a primary care setting. The results of this research is what you see here. The first thing that we noticed is the first question in the algorithm, why is the patient taking the medication? That might sound simple, but I think many of us who work clinically will understand that sometimes you can't remember why a drug was started. The patient doesn't know and it may not have been documented or continued as the patient's moved. So that's the first step that this algorithm talks about. Once we can confirm the diagnosis, we can talk about whether or not it's appropriate to deprescribe, and if so, how do we deprescribe? The final thing that we found really important was monitoring. Just like we wouldn't start a drug without ever seeing a patient again, it's important to monitor a patient when we stop a drug. So it goes through some guidelines on how that can be done and by whom. On the back of the brochure, we also explain what the common antipsychotics are in this case. We have brochures for antipsychotics, as well as for benzodiazepines, as well as, as, well as for drugs used to treat diabetes. Importantly, in the top right, We've got a box that talks about how do we engage patients and their caregivers? How do we bring them along on this journey? Because it needs to be something they're involved with rather than something that's just dictated to stop medication. We need to taper drugs. And importantly, what can we do for managing sleep or managing behavioural and psychological symptoms of dementia? One of the things that Caden's been doing over the last year is developing a range of tools and we'll be releasing those over this coming year. We're trying to engage patients and members of the public much in the same way that Choosing Wisely is engaging healthcare providers and members of the public so that we're all on the same page talking about are these medicines necessary, are we overusing them, are there safer alternatives we could use. So for anyone who's in the Montreal region on April 26, we're actually hosting a deprescribing expo with members of parliament and a whole load of seniors and people who care for seniors and attending. So we plan to release some of these tools and really get the conversation started both at a policy level, healthcare provider level and patient level. If you'd like more information, I've got Isabel Reid's email address there or you can contact me. As I said previously, we have a whole range of tools on our website at deprescribing.org for antipsychotics, benzodiazepines, sedative hypnotics, proton pump inhibitors, sulfonylureas, antihistamines. If there's anything you'd like in hard copy, I'd be more than happy to send them out to you. And I think at this point, I'm going to hand it back to Kay. Thank you very much.
Great. Well, thank you so much, Justin, Wendy, and Dennis, for such insightful presentations and, and providing uh, us and the, all the, the users out there, the, the participants, some very practical tools and takeaways, resources that can, uh, can be referred to and used uh, in, in future programming or future consideration, um, regardless of what, um, what lens you're bringing to this, whether you're a family member, uh, a patient or resident yourself, um, or a practitioner or administrator, all really helpful. Uh, we hope that you all found it informative as well. I don't see any questions at this point, um, but I'll give it I'll give it a couple more moments. Um, we're just hearing from Susan that it seems that it would be more important to get the medical professionals to get on the deprescribing bandwagon. And so that whole theme of engagement is uh, is so critical, and we heard that throughout the presentations as well. Um, well, we started this discussion focused on antipsychotic um, reduction. You certainly heard, as Wendy mentioned, as opening it up to really making sure we account for the importance of thinking about uh, appropriate medication management um, and the deprescribing spectrum, thinking of polypharmacy and unnecessary treatments and tests that go along with it to ensure the highest quality of care for, for our Canadians and for residents themselves. So please, if you do have any questions about Caden, about Choosing Wisely, or about the AUA Connections Group, or about the appropriate use of antipsychotic work that's going on in New Brunswick or that's happened on um, the pan-Canadian level. Please do contact any of us that were um, a part of this presentation. We'd be happy to loop you in and, and answer any of your questions or take any of your comments. I do see a couple of people are typing right now. Um, and, and Jen Major asked the question, um, what are the perspectives of the presenters on a national pharmacare program versus money and efforts going into appropriate prescribing initiatives? Um, Wendy, Justin, or Dennis, would any of you like to um, take, a, take a crack at responding to Jen's question? It's, it's Justin. Give it. Can I just, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Justin. Thanks, Dennis. Um, firstly, I'll respond to, to Susan's question and then jump on to Jen's. Um, I agree, Susan, that it is very important to get the medical professions on board the deprescribing bandwagon, and I think colleagues at Choosing Wisely are doing a fantastic job with that. Um, but what we found in, in the EMPOWER trial was that without contacting healthcare providers or anyone and just posting a an information leaflet to patients, we had a 27% reduction in benzodiazepines. We followed up those results thinking that's really patient driven and unusual and we're finding that yes, physicians feel a lot more comfortable broaching the difficult question which someone else raised, how do you get people off when they've been on the long term? When a patient comes in saying, I've just read this and I'm not so sure, it opens up that conversation and gives the physician a green light to talk about it. So I think we need to empower both the physicians to be ready for this and know what to do, but also patients to ask for it. And then if I go back to Jen's question um, regarding pharmacare versus money and efforts into inappropriate prescribing initiatives, I think both have a place. Uh, I think there is some evidence around the world for how we can use policy and pharmacare and funding to control medications, but I think a lot of it comes down to improving awareness like Choosing Wisely is doing, like Caden is doing, like AUA is doing, and actually working at the coalface to get these things to change. And Dennis here, just adding to the two parts there, one on physician engagement, we found that in the long-term care work that we're doing in Alberta that it's often the nurses in the long-term care settings that are asking the physicians for the uh, prescription. And so a, an effort around uh, two things. One is uh, education and support for uh, non-pharmaceutical interventions when there's a responsive behavior that's challenging. And also a thoughtful interdisciplinary medication review process uh, held on a regular basis, at least monthly, where uh, key interventions that helps with the uh, increasing the appropriate use of antipsychotics and then layered in there, as we're able to develop champions at multiple levels, including physicians at the facility level or the zone or provincial level, 
we're able to engage physicians not as great as we wanted to, but we, we did develop a number of physician champions and they made a difference in, in the sites where they were at. But when there were other champions uh, taking the lead, that really was helpful. And then the second uh, part of the discussion, uh, probably uh, best to, for me to duck the question on the National PharmaCare program and let the um, system leaders sort through that. But I'm a strong proponent that however we set up the budgets uh, in our various jurisdictions, that there be an innovation fund so that uh, work can occur that normally wouldn't happen in a normal, uh, a normal budget situation. So people can apply to an innovation fund to do things like implement uh, work on the margin to improve quality, in this case, the appropriate use of antipsychotics. So this is Wendy. I've been sort of looking at some of these questions. And um, I just would say, you know, in any area where you want to stop something that's been in place for a long time, like de-implement or de-prescribe, there, there, the, um, there are multiple levers you can use that depend on the things that are leading to its overuse. So I think that that's why you're hearing there are approaches that can work on the patient level. There are approaches where we can engage doctors, but there are also information technology approaches. So in the, you know, often patients get started, for example, on benzodiazepines in the hospital, and then they go home on those benzodiazepines. So you know, in a number of settings, in the inpatient setting, they're embedding prompts when a physician goes to order a benzodiazepine that says, you know, do you know the choosing wisely recommendation about not using these in people over 65, basically. So, and of course, they have a good impact. So I think that these are complex problems, why someone gets started on a drug, how it gets main, people get maintained on the drug. And actually, for different drugs, the, um, it's a different story, um, proton pump inhibitors versus benzodiazepines, for example. So I think there are multiple levers that, depending on the situation, can be used to improve the situation, some which are systems level, some which are patient level, some which are doctor level, and some which are policy. And we need to think about all those when we tackle one of these overuse problems. Great. Thank, thanks very much, Wendy. We also have a question that's come in from Stella who asks, how do you organize remote region subscribing in these tools? Um, any reflections from Justin, Dennis, or Wendy in terms of the access, I believe, and, and use of these tools in uh, remote regions? Maybe, maybe this is Wendy again. Maybe I can just make a brief comment. So, you know, choosing wisely as established hubs, regions in a lot of areas, including in the territories, and, um, you know, we are hoping that those uh, regions will help disseminate this. But all of these things are online and free. And um, and there are these collaboratives like we just heard about with antipsychotics and uh, Choosing Wisely has uh, something called Choosing Wisely Talks where we have regular webinars like this. So I think that while it's challenging in some faraway places, it's, I think the world has become easier to access all of these things electronically just as we're doing now. Just adding to that as well, one of the approaches we have in Alberta is something we're calling curbside consulting. And uh, we have uh, er, uh, clinicians from across the province, physicians, nurses, and others are coming together voluntarily to participate in the curbside consultations. And essentially what happens is uh, someone from one of the uh, facilities uh, presents or, or suggests a topic for the curbside consultation, a one-page kind of case study is, is prepared and then presented uh, at a curbside consultation. It's a webinar kind of approach. And we're getting about 60 to 70 clinicians from the province each month participating in these, and it's growing each month. Uh, so they're, they're liking the um, direct applicability on a sort of a mini case study approach. Uh, so there's another idea for you if you're in a, in a rural area on uh, improving skills around the appropriate use of antipsychotics. 
That's great. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis and Wendy, for those insights. Um, we have a, a, a question coming from Anne, um, who's asking about, you know, since we use CHI-HI data almost exclusively, why has CHI-HI not changed the definition of antipsychotics in appropriate use? Now, I'm not necessarily in a position to respond on behalf of CHI-HI there, and I don't know if anyone else on the phone has any insights. Um, I know we had a, a representative from CHI-HI on the line earlier. I don't know if they have any reflections um, they can share um, in the chat box, but um, are there any comments, um, uh, Wendy, Dennis, or Justin, around, uh, I guess, the, the role of CHI-HI in some of the definitions and, 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 um, and how antipsychotics and appropriate use are actually measured? My sense is that it's important that there be a standard measure and just working with data, it probably doesn't matter too much which clinical area, in this case the use of antipsychotics, there's always going to be different views on what the definition should be. Uh, what I, and so there's imperfections in, in many definitions. And then when you start using the data, you find that there's potentially some data, data quality things, but it improves as you're using the data. So as long as there's a consistent definition and people are using it, being mindful of how uh, the definition comes together into the actual numbers, then you can still make uh, decisions at the uh, system level, the regional level, the facility level, and even the frontline level on where you might pursue a quality improvement initiative. So. I'm not as worried if there's, uh, you know, different views on the definition itself. Kai Hai is Hi. about to come out with a, uh, a report. It's going to release it in April with eight measures of overuse across the jurisdictions across Canada. Not all of them can be measured in all of the jurisdictions, but I know benzodiazepines um, and uh, some of the, and I think antipsychotics are in that data set. Great, thank you. Yeah, from, I can, sorry, I know that uh, Choosing Wisely and both, and Caden as well, have worked with Kaiha to look at these things. And when you say are they updating how they determine it, it is, it's quite complex, because not only does it rely on the dose of the drug, um, for example, antipsychotics, quetiapine used at low dose for a sedative as opposed to high dose as an antipsychotic is one way that it can be determined. Um, trying to link it through with hospital records, primary care records, admissions, discharge summaries, are all things that have been tried to try and make sure that we find out what the indication for the drug was and therefore is it appropriate. Because many of the medications that we talk about may be appropriate long term, such as PPIs, for the right indication. And the difficulty in defining something from a health data set, such as CHI-HI data, is trying to go back and find out what the indication was, which isn't linked with pharmacy claims, obviously. So why hasn't CHI-HI updated it? Probably because it's very, very difficult. But they are making some very good progress. It's easier, I might add, in issues where it is not, a, you don't need as much clinical data to answer the appropriateness. So benzodiazepines in people over 65 are pretty contraindicated for almost anything without a clinical indication. So in some conditions, some drugs like that, it's easier than in antipsychotics. Thank you. Thanks to Jennifer Weir, who mentioned uh, Island Health Authorities work on uh, polypharmacy. So uh, that, that's great to hear the work that's being done there on reducing polypharmacy. You can contact Jennifer Weir at the Vancouver Island Health Authority. Um, we've also had uh, some additional comments and questions come in. Um, Colleen Hicks, uh, how Dr. H. Cosman, uh, who's now deceased, once stated that as long as someone has been on benzos, they might they may take the same length of time to get off the med. Stopping too fast may be very risky. Um, I, and there's a question mark there. Um, Wendy or Justin, any, any reflections on that comment uh, from Colleen in terms of uh, the, 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 the titration of benzos? Justin, do you want to go or me? Yeah, I, I can answer that. So that's one of the things that Barb Power's group looked at in developing the deprescribing algorithms on benzodiazepines. And they looked at what is the evidence for tapering and how do you taper and how often. 
In the summary of the literature review showed tapering slowly is the best thing, getting patient engagement is the best thing. Most of the trials that have been conducted in this area look at reducing the dose by about 25% every two weeks, and if possible, maybe 12.5% reductions towards the end of that, or having a drug-free day. Some trials have looked at converting people to long-acting benzodiazepines such as diazepam, but there wasn't really any benefit in that, so as opposed to leaving them on the drug they're used to. So yes, tapering should be done because you can get adverse withdrawal effects if you stop it quickly, and they can be nasty. But really, I think the message that I get from the work that Barb's done is it needs to be done gradually to avoid those physiological effects, but also in conjunction with the patient to make sure that they're engaged in the process, willing to be involved in the process, and we'll see it through to the end. Not sure if you have anything else to, to add, Wendy? No, I think that's fine. That's great. Thank you very much. And Justin Mielen uh, was wondering if there is a link for the Montreal conference that perhaps he could share in the chat box, or uh, if it's best to contact uh, the, the, the person who uh, you mentioned in the presentation. I will put Isabel's email address in the chat box. She has all the details. Perfect. Thanks very much. Okay, um, we do have some other questions. So thanks everyone, uh, everyone for for using the chat. Um, really good, good, good questions coming in uh, from Colleen. Should personal support workers, especially in long-term care, be registered with the nursing colleges so that training can be standardized and updated regularly? So I guess this really speaks to uh, some of the, the scope of work training of uh, some of our PSWs um, to ensure that these types of uh, practices and, and prescribing practices are, are understood along the way. Um, any comments on, on the roles of PSWs here um, and standardization? Not right now. Okay, so why don't we move to the next question. Are stats from accreditation useful in do prescribing auditing from Colleen? Um, any reflections on, on, on the use of stats from accreditation um, for B prescribing? Yep, it's so Colleen, Justin here again. Okay. Oh, sorry. Please, go ahead. Um, speaking from the Australian context, because that's where I was working for a much longer period of time, um, part of the accreditation process now includes that what they call drug use evaluations or a review of the appropriateness of medicines is conducted at least once a year, preferably four times a year on certain medications and the ones that have been flagged are appropriate use of antipsychotics and or appropriate use of benzodiazepines. Um, the two are sort of linked because some of the early work done in Australia found that if benzodiazepine use went down, antipsychotic use went up, and then when that was targeted, antipsychotic use went down and benzodiazepine use went up. The interventions have got better, and I'd have to say I'm really impressed with the work AUA has done in the New Brunswick area where antipsychotics went down, but because of the behavioural interventions and culture change that was brought around, benzodiazepine use did not increase. So I thought that was a fantastic outcome for the AUA work done there. Thanks very much, Justin, for that insight. Um, and as you see, um, the, the link for the Montreal Expo has been uh, posted, or shall I say the email for the contact Isabel has been posted. So if you have anything else to add, Justin, there, that's fantastic. In the meantime, though, I think uh, I don't see any other questions coming through, so we're going to keep moving along. And, and again, I want to thank everyone for joining CFHI um, all through this on-call series on transforming care for the elderly and ensuring our seniors receive appropriate and person-centered care. Thanks again to our speakers, Dr. Levinson, uh, Dr. Turner, as well as to Mr. Dennis O'Leary from Alberta. Um, we do have free recordings available um, on the CFHI website at cfhi-fcass.ca, um, there you can find all there you can find um, archived versions of the three webinars that were part of this series. 
We do hope that you uh, found this session and series informative and ask that you join us again in the near future. On the slide, uh, you'll see a list of some of our upcoming webinars um, that you're welcome to join. We also value your feedback um, and it's invaluable to us for future webinar design. So we ask that you please just take a moment to provide some feedback on today's session. We also invite you to sign up for our CFHI newsletter and keep an eye on your email for a full listing of our upcoming webinars. Once again, I'd like to thank Dennis, Wendy, and Justin for their excellent presentations today, to Kelly, Sheena, and Jen Major uh, who have been behind the scenes to make this webinar happen. And of course, thank you to all of you, our audience, for joining us today. This concludes our webinar and we hope you have a great rest of the week. This concludes today's call. Thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect.